Hey everybody, good afternoon. Just wanted to chime in as I told everybody yesterday I was going to and give some bonus content. Uh, this is a sermon series that I was working on before the coronavirus outbreak hit and really threw everything uh, up in the air. And so since I'd already worked out most of the next three sermons in this Bible study for busy people series, I wanted to continue with that series, but also wanted to preach some sermons on Sunday that really speak to sort of the felt needs of folks right now. So uh, how I figured I would handle this is preach what I um, am planning to preach on Sunday and go live with our service. And then on Mondays, the next three Mondays, finish up this series that we've called Bible Study for Busy People. If you're tuning in live, and this is maybe the first time that you've seen this, uh, maybe you're not a member at Carlson Street and you wanna figure out what the previous two sermons were in this sermon series, um, I would encourage you to go to our website, which is hopewellchurchofchrist.com, and you can find the audio from those previous two sermon series. This was one of those sermon series that I planned at the beginning of the year as I was praying and uh, planning and praying over uh, the work here at Carlson Street. And one of the things that we wanted to focus on this year was doing better at Bible study, trying to get better at studying our Bibles. And one of the big ideas of this sermon series was Christians should be people who study their Bible. Bottom line, uh, if you weren't a Christian and then you became a Christian, one of the things that should change about your life is you should see a serious increase in the amount of time that you spend studying the Bible. And yet in my own experience, with my own struggles, with consistency, with just talking to people, I know that folks struggle with consistency when it comes to studying their Bibles. And so, I wanted to delve into this series of lessons to give some ideas and, and explore the parameters of this topic on how can we be people who study the Bible in a very busy time frame. And I think I mentioned it yesterday, it seems a little ironic that I began this series a couple of weeks ago, not knowing anything at all about the coronavirus and, and the coronavirus virus comes along and just detonates all of our plans. And so folks have a little bit more time on their hands, at least some people do. Uh, right now. But the question is, what are we going to do with that time? Are we going to continue to study our Bibles? Are we going to start studying our Bibles? You know, there's a lot of other stuff, uh, Netflix and video games and just fill in the blank that we can fill our time with. So uh, maybe one of the blessings that could come out of this challenging period of time is we can carve out now that we a lot of us have more time, we could carve out some time in our daily life to study the Bible. So we're going to do two things very quickly in this lesson today. Uh, one thing we're going to do is look at five non-negotiables when it comes to the Bible. And these are things that every Christian should believe about the Bible and hold as, as sincere convictions about the Bible. And after that, we're going to give three suggestions, how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible, and then how to study the Bible in church as Christians. So let's begin by looking at these five non-negotiables that pertain to uh, uh, the Bible as Christians. The first thing that we, we need to hold as a non-negotiable principle regarding Bible study is that the scriptures are inspired. Of course, you think of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Paul there says, all scripture is inspired by God. And the word inspired there is translated by the King James Version and the New King James Version in a more literal sense. It is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. And that is to say that God, through his Holy Spirit, superintended the process in the writing of these 66 books that we call scripture. Even though there was human authors, God's Spirit superintended those things. And that's what we mean by the inspiration of scripture. Christians must believe in their inspiration of scriptures. Number two, Akin to the first point, the authority of scriptures. You think about 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, where Peter said, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own private interpretation. That is to say, because Peter knew that God was superintending this process. And he goes on to say that men who were moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so the scriptures are authoritative because they have a divine source. God was superintending that process. And therefore, because there is no greater and higher authority, the scriptures have a unique sense of authority because they have a divine source of origin. 
Going on to number three, though, a third non-negotiable principle that we must hold as Christians is the accessibility of truth. You know, we live in a postmodern time where truth is viewed as relative. And people sort of throw their hands up in the air and say, can you even know such a thing as truth? Well, if you understand those first two points, that the scriptures are inspired and that the scriptures are authoritative, then you can understand that the scriptures also make the claim that you can know truth. You think of John 8, 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, you will be truly disciples of mine and you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so what is the key to knowing truth? According to Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32, the key according to Jesus is abiding in that word of his, abiding in the scriptures, the things in which have been given to us. A fourth non-negotiable principle that we need to keep in mind and hold as convictions as Christians is the responsibility of mankind to discover truth. God places the burden of discovering truth on us. He doesn't have to come into our lives at every single generation and stand before us and lecture us and speak to us the truth all over again. In fact, in the Bible, we have God's truths communicated once for all time. He's not going to come back again and give us a second Bible. What we have is what we're going to get. And therefore, mankind has a responsibility to get to know God through the scriptures. You think about what Jesus said in John 14 or verse 6 when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Well, this is it. If we don't believe what Jesus said, if we don't believe that he is the way and the truth and the life, then we're not going to have a way to have access to God. And therefore, there is a responsibility on each of us, and we as Christians especially should know this and hold this as a conviction. There's a responsibility for each of us to seek out God and to study and understand him through our study of the scriptures. And a fifth non-negotiable principle that I want to bring to your attention this afternoon is the accountability of God's word, the accountability of God's word. That is to say that all of the world is going to be held accountable to this truth that has been revealed to us that comes from this divine source of origin. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says that the word of God is living and active and sharp as a two-edged sword. And it goes on to explain how it, it, it searches out the thoughts and intentions of the heart of men. And therefore, human beings will be held accountable for how we have treated his word. So let's go on to these three points that I wanted to make concerning doing Bible study. If we hold those convictions, and we rightly should, I believe, then we understand that the scriptures is not just some self-help book. It is a book that comes from a divine source of origin. It carries with it the force of divine authority. And in it, we have access to divine truth. And it is our responsibility as human beings to study it because we're going to be held accountable to it. But what does that look like in our daily busy lives? Well, consider these three things. Number one, how do we read the Bible? when we are busy. I think one of the challenges is, and we talked about this in an earlier session, was to just find the time, to make time in our lives. It's easy in this busy world to fill your time with lots of other things. Well, how do we read the Bible? And again, I, I make a distinction between reading and study. I think there should be both. We see in scripture the admonition to read the scriptures, and we also see the admonition to study the scriptures. Well, in this first point, when it comes to reading the Bible, consider these three things. First of all, set realistic goals. You know, I think some people start in January and they go out and they get these Bibles and this year long uh, reading plans and they get to maybe the book of Leviticus and, and they lose interest and, and they fall off and it becomes inconsistent and it gets to the point where they just say, yeah, what's the point? You know, uh, I haven't done it in a week or two weeks and I'm so far behind now. And, and they just go back to the same habits that they've had before. Well, if you haven't been reading your Bible, set some realistic goals. I think it's it's not a smart thing if you haven't been consistently reading your Bible to say, you know what, I'm going to read the entire Bible in 90 days. Uh, there's a good Bible reading plan out there, the B90 uh, Bible reading plan. Well, that's a challenge if you haven't already been reading the scriptures. It's kind of like those, those health apps, the Couch to 5K. When you open up one of those apps, it doesn't tell you, step one, get up off the couch. Step two, run 5K. 
There's a lot of incremental steps working up to that. So my suggestion is set some realistic goals. Maybe just focus on reading one book. Maybe start even with one shorter book and, and set some realistic goals as you ease yourself into reading the Bible and work yourself up to where now that it's become consistent, you can read more chunks of scripture. And then eventually maybe you will have this consistent Bible reading plan where you can read the Bible through in a year, or even in 90 days. But a second thing, and I don't want to come back to this, is that we have to set a time. You know, statistics say and the research show that if you can do something consistently for a month, you can make it a habit. And I think I think one of the most important things for us as busy people to do is to have a set time for us to read the Bible. And you know you better than anybody else. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier on that for me, if I don't get up in the mornings and, and get going early and read my Bible or study my Bible, it's hard for me because uh, when I get to the office or when I get going, I've got a big family at home. I've got a lot of responsibilities at the church. And it's just tough for me to carve out an hour or even 30 minutes in my day to just sit down and read the Bible. So that's what works for me. But what works for you? Uh, maybe it is uh, at, at lunch when you are at work, you've got an hour lunch break, or maybe for you it is in the evenings once you get home. But I think what's important is to have a set time and to stick with it, to make that, going back to our previous slide, non-negotiables, make that time non-negotiable. This is time that I'm going to devote to reading the Bible. And then a third thing to do is to have an encouragement partner. It's always good to have someone there to hold us accountable, to communicate to them, hey, I'm starting this Bible reading plan, or I'm going to read the book of Romans, a chapter a day for the next 16 days. Will you encourage me? Will you be my encouragement partner and help me to stick to it because I've struggled with consistency in the past? So maybe this could be your spouse or maybe if you're older and your children are adults, it could be one of your children or maybe it can be someone at church or maybe it can be a friend that can you can meet up with on Facebook. I think having an encouragement partner, someone that can hold you accountable will help us to stick to uh, our consistent plan in reading the Bible. All right, that's a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, reading the Bible. What about studying the Bible? How do we study the Bible when we are busy? Well, it starts with having a good Bible and, and using it. Again, going back to reading it, but having a good Bible that you feel comfortable with. I've got in my hand right here one of my Bibles. It's got nice margins in it. I've got several Bibles in my library that I use, but all of them I've selected and the ones that I use consistently because they work for me. Uh, I like the Bibles that have wide margins and I like some of the Bibles that mark the keywords and those sorts of things. And, and I've even got a couple of good study Bibles that I like to make reference to every once in a while. Whatever it is for you, get yourself a good Bible that you like. You like the font, you like the layout, you like the the translation, you get a good, uh, good uh, reputable translation. Whatever it is, get yourself a good Bible that is yours. Make yourself comfortable with it. Personalize it. Get your name on it. Get it in a cover. Whatever it is, it starts with having a good Bible. And then once you've got a Bible, you've got to add the right tools around it. You know, a few years ago when I worked in industrial maintenance, one of the things that was very important was having the right tools. If you showed up and you didn't have the right tools for the job, it could be very difficult to finish the job. And so if we don't understand the kind of tools that is necessary to go, do good Bible study, we're not going to delve into God's word in the way that we should. And, and fortunately, you and I live in a day and age um, that we have plenty of tools available to us. There's lots of church um, or rather not church, but Bible software that's available out there for us. There's a plenty of resources that you can download, order a, a lexicon or a concordance from Amazon, and they'll ship it to you and it'll probably be there tomorrow. But there's lots of tools that go into Bible study. Some of those include, number one, having the right Bible that we just talked about. Number two, having a lexicon or concordance, which allows you to look up verses and look up words of the Bible and get immediate definitions. Number three, having something, and I really encourage this, like an online software. There's so many different free websites, so many uh, cheap, affordable software that you can download to your computer that can help you to, just in a few clicks of a button, go deep in studying the Bible. I only want to suggest one, but I have used for well over a decade now Logos Bible software. Now you can get it all the way up from scholarly packages where the software costs thousands of dollars 
down to like 50 or 60 bucks, which comes with a variety of real basic Bible study tools. And you download that right to your computer and it, it exponentially increases your ability to do good quality Bible study. And so I highly recommend someone to get something like Logos Bible Software. And even if you don't like that, there's plenty of books out there. You can go to christianbookdistributors.com and, and you can look up those different kinds of resources that I mentioned, concordances and lexicons, even commentaries. If you're working through a particular book of the Bible, get yourself a good commentary. Ask one of the leaders at church and I'm sure they can point you in a direction. But number three, once we've got the, a good Bible and once we've got a few tools in our tool bag, we actually got to sit down and study those passages and words. And again, I got to emphasize, this is different than reading. Reading has its place, but studying where we actually slow down and we focus on a text, maybe a, a, a collection of three or four verses, and we start to study and ask questions. Questions like, who is this written to? And, and why was it written? And, and how does this apply once I've studied through that passage? How does this apply to myself? That's what Bible study looks like. Or to look at the words, such as righteousness or faith or baptism, and to say, what is Peter mean by baptism in 1 Peter 3, 21, for example, or what does Paul mean by righteousness? And, and how does that compare with the way that Matthew uses uh, the word righteousness and studying those, those words out? And that's where you start making use of the tools that you have in your tool bag. And then you start applying it to other passages. You start making the, the connections between what Paul said in righteousness in Romans and then what he says about it over in the book of Galatians, for example. Or you may start to, to make connections between the Old Testament and then the New Testament. And so you look at what the Hebrew writer says about Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, for example. And then you go back and see how Jeremiah when he first spoke those things, what it meant to the people then, and then what it meant to the people that the Hebrew writer was writing to. That's Bible study. But the bottom line is, when we are busy, we've got to carve out that time, time to read our Bible, but also time for us to sit down with our good Bible that we've chosen, to lay out the tools that are in our tool bag in front of us, and to actually study those things out. And another thing that I might add to this, get yourself just a good little notebook. Maybe it's just a cheap little uh, uh, one subject notebook from Walmart. I like the moleskin notebooks that you can get from Office Depot or Staples. And then just write down the things that you learned and sort of just journal down the, the, the things that you've studied out and that'll help you to go a long way. All right, what about this third point that I wanna make mention of? How to study the Bible in church when you're busy. I think one of the greatest benefits of assembling, and I know we're all struggling to adapt to the coronavirus right now, and a lot of churches are are streaming online, and, and that has its pros and cons. Uh, personally, I'm grateful to have that opportunity, but I sure did miss yesterday being with the brethren. Uh, but regardless, Sunday's always gonna be the Lord's day, and it's always been prudent, and this is why churches do it, to find other times to study the Bible, and not just on Sunday. And so we've adapted with Sunday night worship services and Wednesday night Bible class. But one of the things about church is you're gonna get out of it what you put into it. You're gonna get out of it from, uh, uh, you're gonna get out of uh, that service, be it a Bible class or a worship service, what you put into it. So consider these three things when it comes to how to study the Bible in church when we are busy. I see Miss Carla Crutchfield chimed in. It's good to see Miss Carla with us today. She was already at the church building. So I already said hi to her today, but I'm saying hi to her again online now. So the first thing that we want to consider is it starts with preparation ahead of time. A friend of mine told me a few years back that his mother taught him Saturday nights are for prepper, prepping for Sundays. And she wouldn't allow their family to schedule any kind of big events on Saturday evening or the kids to stay up late because she wanted her kids to be prepared to go to church on Sunday. And so when you think about that, how prepared are we to go to church? Do we know where that good Bible that we've chosen is? Have, has it been in the back seat of the car since last Sunday? Um, do we got our notebook that we're gonna take notes with at church? You know, there's a whole list of things that we could talk about, but I think it starts with preparing to go to church. And while I'm there, learn. You know there's going to be a sermon preached. You know Bible class is going to be offered. You know there's going to be 
maybe other opportunities for you to glean some information from the people that you're around. Be prepared ahead of time. And secondly, utilize different methods of learning. And I think this is one of the things that is so critical that a lot of folks don't take advantage of. You know, from a preacher standpoint, I have utilized many different ways of studying the material that I've put into the sermon. I have used my software. I've developed visual aids, such as the, the PowerPoint presentation that is on the screen behind me. Uh, sometimes I've viewed maps and I've looked at charts and I've looked at lists. And, and there's a lot of different tools that come come into that. Now, when I stand up and preach, I'm using maybe two methods. I'm communicating those words out of my mouth and I'm using a visual aid that will help to stimulate learning. One of the things that I try to make available each and every week is an outline. And that's a third technique is you could sit there and outline. But you know what? A lot of people just don't do it. I look out into the audience and they're only stimulating themselves to learn in this one way. They're, or maybe the two ways. They're listening and they're looking at the screen, but that only goes so far. You know, why don't you try to jot down some things, not just on the, the notes, the sermon snippets that we provide, but maybe jot it down in that notebook that you brought with you and then plan on later going back and, and going through those notes. And if you see something that you think is valuable that you want to transfer into your good study Bible, then get yourself some pens, get yourself some markers and go and, and highlight those things and write them in the margin of your Bibles. And, and, and here's the idea. The more methods of learning that we utilize, the better that information is going to stick into our brains. Our brains are like this leaky bucket and it's always leaking out information. And if we don't make the effort to to utilize different methods of learning, then we're going to be we're going to be challenged uh, in retaining that information. And so when we're in church, part of being prepared is is coming so that we can utilize different methods of learning. And then lastly, how about going back and revisiting what you learn? I think a great uh, habit to have is to sit around the table if your family has lunch together on Sundays and to talk about those things. Or maybe if it's not on Sundays, maybe it's a, another day of the week, but you're going to go back and revisit the things that you've learned on Sunday. And the idea is to keep it fresh. Maybe it's to go to that accountability partner we mentioned in the first point or to uh, to go out and and maybe invite someone to coffee and, and talk about these things, whatever it is. I think going back and revisiting what you learned is is one of the most helpful things you can do after we've gone to church and we've put our, our best foot forward in learning while we were there. All right, so we talked about five non-negotiables as it pertains to the Bible for Christians. And we've also talked about three things to, to keep in mind about how to read and study the Bible as we are very busy people. In this next lesson that we're going to present next Monday at two o'clock, we're going to focus in on, and this is completely by coincidence, even though I had already planned it, how to stay grounded in rough weather. And boy, it's a storm out there right now. I got to tell you, you know, and I think having good Bible study habits and, and being grounded in those habits, when the times get tough, when the seasons of life change to rougher weather, can be of great benefit in keeping us faithful and keeping us grounded. So that's what we're going to talk about next Tuesday, or I'm sorry, next Monday at two o'clock when we continue on in our Bible study for busy people. I see a few people, Miss Carla and Miss Betty joined us and chimed in. I appreciate you. We will make this particular video available also on our church's YouTube channel once I get it over to our Deacon of Technology, uh, Dennis Inglis, and we'll get it uploaded over there. But again, I appreciate you uh, chiming in and uh, checking out this bonus sermon content. Hopefully it's been helpful to you, and I hope that you have a blessed rest of the day.